Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we're just gonna allow a couple of uh, minutes for everyone to join and then we will start with the presentations. Okay, uh, so welcome everyone to this open air webinar on Horizon Europe Open Science Requirements in Practice. Thanks for joining us today. We have two members of the open air team, uh, Jonathan England, our open science training specialist, and Julia Malaguarnera, our outreach and engagement officer with us. Uh, they will be speaking about all aspects of the Horizon Europe Open Science Requirements and share some tips and tools uh, uh, with you. So this webinar will be recorded and we will make the recording publicly available afterwards as well as the slides. If you can use the Q&A to post any questions you might have for our speakers and we will be addressing all questions at the end of the, of the webinar. Uh, the time that this will take will be approximately one hour to one hour and a half, depending on how many questions you, you have. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to Jonathan to begin the presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning for me. I don't know if you're from a different place where it's afternoon or evening. Um, so as Asine said, we are going to uh, give an overview of the Horizon Europe Open Science requirements uh, during the project and at the end of the project. We will also talk about uh, the Open Research Europe platform, which is the European Commission's public publication uh, platform. And I will also talk about the Horizons Europe grant proposal, the open science parts towards the end of the presentation. So uh, the slides are already online. On, on the bottom of the, um, the slides, you can see the, the link to it. Um, on the slides, you will find a lot more information than I'm going to cover with all the different guides to the direct links to the European Commission's uh, links to the documents, as well as uh, the guides that we've created uh, for you. If you're watching this uh, online because it is recorded and will be on, on YouTube, the next webinar will be on Monday, the 3rd of July at uh, 12 uh, um, CT. Um, so it will be basically the same presentation, but you can ask your questions then. So um, just to give an overview of uh, open science in terms of what the European Commission considers open science, obviously we have the usual open access to publication, um, the management of uh, good practices in terms of data management, the principles, as I'll go back to this, but the, the motto of the European Commission, which is our open access to data as open as possible, as close as necessary. Um, but there are two more elements that the European Commission does uh, insist on is, um, and you will see it throughout the, um, the presentation that I, I do um, add it quite often, is the fact that you need to add any information or about output tools instruments to validate and reuse the results on the data. So they do insist a lot on that. And obviously you need to have both uh, access of results, both digitally and, and physically, if that's relevant for your type of research. So I'll first start in terms of publications, because usually that's the topic that most people know about. It is slightly different from the, um, H2020 um, requirements. In this Horizon Europe uh, grants, you do have to uh, deposit your all your manuscripts, your peer-reviewed version of the manuscript on uh, what they call a trusted repository. I will go back to the different version of the manuscript and what a trusted repository is, but I'm just giving you an overview right now. Uh, so you have to deposit those publication on a repository. 
the biggest difference is that it has to be uh, made available in open access immediately upon publication. So the embargo period that was authorized of between six to 12 months, depending on the field before, is not um, valid anymore. So it has to be immediately. The other biggest difference is that you as author needs to retain your rights at least on what we call the author accepted manuscript, the AAM. And again, I will go back to this in a second. And you have to apply a Creative Commons uh, CC BY uh, license. Again, as I said before, um, you need to add any type of information about the research outputs to tools, instruments, that you need to validate uh, the conclusions of the publication. And as a reminder, this has been for any type of funder, but uh, people do tend to forget it sometimes to add it on the publications, to add the acronym, the code of the, the project within the publications. There are a few specificities, especially if you're funded by other funders that might differ from the way that the European Commission deals with article processing charges. So when you pay the publisher for um, publishing in open access. Some funders will not allow what we call hybrid journal, where it's a subscription type of journal, but that also allows you to uh, pay for open access. Some funders don't allow you to, to publish in those anymore. Um, the European Commission does, so there's no restrictions on where you can publish, it's just what is reimbursed. If the venue is a full open access, meaning that the only way of publishing in a journal is by paying open access fees, then that's reimbursable under the uh, European Commission, under the Horizon Europe grant. But if it's a hybrid journal, you can publish in it, but you will have to find the money to pay the APCs in a different way. You cannot use the grant for, for that. Um, just a, a side note for uh, people that in their field publish as uh, monographs or long text formats, um, you are allowed to use an, a Creative Commons um, non-commercial or non-derivatives uh, license. So the different versions, um, once you have happy with your draft and you send it to the, um, to the journal, it is what we call the preprint version. So it's before peer review. It goes through the process of peer reviewing and then the final version, which is uh, has been peer reviewed approved becomes the author accepted manuscript. Um, before it was also uh, called the postprint. Um, it's what I call the ugly version of your of your paper. It's basically the unformatted version of your of your paper. Once the publisher goes through copy editing, it becomes the what we call the version of records. Previously it was also called the publisher's version. This is the um, nice looking version of your, of your paper. So if I go back to those requirements, you have to deposit on the repository, either the author accepted manuscript, so this ugly version, or the final version of the version of the, the author, depending on which rights you, you gained. So it might be that you gain, uh, you retain your rights only on the author accepted manuscript, but the version of record, you do transfer your rights to, to the publisher. So it's something to, to bear in mind in, in which version you can deposit or not. Um, in terms of depositing on a repository, we are on the concept of self-archiving. So it's you as an author are going to deposit on a, on a repository. It is not about, so the, there's a lot of confusion sometimes about what open access is. You don't necessarily have to pay for open access. So it's not um, where you publish, it's how you make it available. There are different um, ways of making it open access. 
Um, and you can now check for the general eligibility in terms of the European Commission by going to this website, the journal checker tool, um, where you put the name of the journal, the funder, European Commission, and your institution, and you will see if it's compatible or not. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the rights retention strategy, just so you know, you have some, not all publishers, but some publishers will allow you to put on, on the preprint. So when you submit to the journal to add this sentence, it's for the purpose of open access. Uh, the author has applied a Creative Commons attribution license to any author accepted manuscript version rising from this submission. If this is accepted by the publisher, this means that when it becomes an author accepted manuscript, so when the peer review has been accepted, this, um, this version automatically uh, becomes uh, publishable under a Creative Commons license. So you as author remain retain your rights. And by definition, because it's under this type of license, you can um, upload it to, the, uh, to any repository. There is also a different route that you can use. Uh, Julia will mention this, which is the Open Research Europe, which is the publishing platform of the uh, European Commission, but she will go back to that um, later. Now, in terms of research data, it is quite similar in a way um, to what is required for publications. Um, the only difference is that there are some requirements in terms of how you make data available to others. It is a bit more complicated to make data useful to others for reuse. And these should these principles are summarized under what we call the FAIR principles of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. There's a lot of things that we can say about those FAIR principles. So obviously this is a webinar about the requirements. So I'm not going to go into details on it. I would highly recommend that if you don't know about the FAIR principles to, um, to look more in detail about it, because it, it is basically the way that your, your data will be uh, reusable by, by others and useful by others. Um, a data management plan is now required by month six. Um, it is a living document, so you need to continuously uh, update it if there's any changes during the project, and it should at least be updated a uh, final version before the end of the project during the submission of the, the, uh, the project. The biggest difference also with uh, the data is that you need to deposit the data if possible, but at least the metadata, so the metadata is all the um, information that is linked to the data. So for instance, if you um, have an audio file, that will be the, the author, the, the name of the track, the um, uh, all these different types, the length of the, the track, all this information about the, the data would be um, the metadata. And you need to deposit that as soon as possible after the creation of or the um, production of the um, of the data. Again, you need to deposit in what they call a trusted repository. I will um, explain exactly what they mean by that uh, in in the next slides. Um, and you need to make them as open as. Um, um, as open as possible, as close as necessary. So if there's any uh, issues in terms of um, personal data, for instance, you can close part of the data, um, but the default is always to be as open as possible. Um, just so the European Commission, you will see if you read the um, the the actual requirements they ask you that the metadata must be fair and under creative commons zero license um you can kind of forget about this because if it's a trusted repository by definition that's what they do so if you selected a, a good repository it will do that for you automatically so you don't really need to uh, take that into consideration 
Depositing data, we, for different reasons, I won't go over today for, for time reasons, uh, is better to um, deposit under a Creative Commons Zero License or a Creative Commons Attribution. And again, uh, same thing as I was mentioning at the beginning of the talk, detailed information must be added to the data on the repository about any research outputs, tools, instruments that are needed to reuse or validate the data. There are uh, three different types of categories that are considered as uh, justified by the European Commission to not opening the data. Um, one of them is commercially valuable data. Um, if sharing it would undermine its exploitation, you can always put an embargo on the data. So if there would be a commercially, um, if it was commercially valuable during the first three years, for instance, and then it would be not that valuable in terms of commercial reuse, then you could close the data for those three years um, until the time that you use it commercially and then uh, open data, data at a later stage. That's always um, an, a possibility. Uh, data protection, obviously personal data, privacy rules, sensitive data, all those are justifications for not opening the data. And obviously, if you have any um, security rules um, that, um, that in your project that deals with uh, strategic assets um, or security of the European Union, then you would uh, also not be sharing that, that data. But the number of projects in that specific area is, uh, I would say quite limited. So you would know anyway if you were in, in that category of uh, projects. So I mentioned quite a few different aspects, which I'm going to go over now. Trusted repositories. There is a very specific, quite technical, which you can see here, you can kind of ignore it. Um, there's some specificities of what is a trusted repository. Basically, what for you, you want to be looking at is first disciplinary or domain specific repositories that are used and endorsed by your research community in your area. Um, if you want to look for one, you can go on Re3Data, which is a portal. Um, so the link is on the right side. It's a portal that will allow you to search repositories per domain. If uh, a repository it doesn't exist in your domain, you can use a general purpose repository such as Zenodo, which has been built specifically for that. So it is, Zenodo is, for instance, um, by definition, a trusted repository. So you know that if you're depositing on Zenodo, then you're fine in terms of uh, all those technical aspects to it. I mentioned a lot the Creative Commons license. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's an actual license, so it's a copyright license, but that specifically tells others that they can reuse under certain um, conditions your work. They from more to less opened, some might be non-commercial reuse, non-derivatives reuse, so you're not allowed to make any modifications. In terms of publications, we always talking about the Creative Commons attribution license where people can do whatever they want with your work, the, the, the text words, as long as they cite you, which is kind of what is being done anywhere nowadays when you cite um, papers in, um, in, your, in your work. But this is a specific license saying you are allowed to do that. For data, uh, it is better to deposit under a Creative uh, Commons Zero license, which is quite similar to a public domain license. There are different reasons why that is the case rather than a Creative Commons attribution license. Um, and I'm happy to answer those questions if you, if you have any. But if you don't want to go into technical reasons of why, just so you know, data should be shared onto CC0. 
data management plan. I think a lot of you have had to write it or will have to write uh, because most funders nowadays do ask for one. It's a formal living document, so you will be updating it throughout the project. It's not something that you write once at before month six and then just not look at it again. It should reflect any modifications that you do during the, the project. Uh, basically, what the data management plan is, you know what you're doing, but you're just proving to the funder that you know what you're doing. So try and be as clear and specific and detailed as possible when you're writing those um, this, this talk document. The biggest difficulty that uh, you as researchers are finding is that there's no absolute right or wrong answers as long as you justify everything. So I cannot tell you, um, for instance, you should not be using um, uh, Dropbox, for instance, which is a commercial uh, um, tool, because you might want to use Dropbox because you don't have any other tool. If you were to have uh, an institutional uh, type of, um, of equivalent tool, then you would favor that one, but there might be reasons why you might want to use Dropbox. As long as you justify why you're using a specific tool or why you're using this commercial uh, or if this closed format of file formats, that's okay, as long as you justify it. So you really need to just um, make sure that the, uh, the project officers don't dig for the information. And you should also, um, as I said before, prove that your data will be following the FAIR principles. Talking about FAIR principles, um, there's a lot of things that we can talk about in the different elements. Few key points per letter in terms of findability, we want a persistent identifier. So that's um, a new URL that will not change. So the DUI mostly, for instance, this presentation is uploaded on Zenodo. This URL that you will see, um, when we do give the presentation in July, there will be a new version, but you will still be able to click on that uh, DOI and it will go to the latest version of this presentation. So it will be always kept up to date. ORCID IDs also, um, you are required to have a unique identifier for you as researchers. This is also um, uh, a person's identifier. In terms of accessibility, you need to deposit it on the, on the trusted repository. Uh, just so you know that it's not because you deposit data or metadata on a repository that it needs to be open. You can close it. That would still be considered as accessible. It's just accessible under certain specific um, conditions. Putting on your manuscript that the data will be available if you email the author, that's not accessible because what happens to, you know, if the author, uh, dice tomorrow, who has access to, to this data. So we want it on a platform that automatically can give can grant access on uh, through a platform. In terms of interoperability, uh, it's basically a, a long word to say that you're using um, open file formats, open standards, uh, so that as many people can reuse your data. And linked to that, reusability is that you want uh, well documented. You don't want like um, um, a table with no explanation of what the different acronyms are. So you want anyone that I come on open your data. I'm able to understand everything that went into into the project. There's a few specific cases that um, should be mentioned, especially after these were included after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there might be um, some restrictions or um, 
data that might be closed, but might be um, required to be given access through specific agreements or to specific people to check for um, reproducibility of the, the data. And in terms of public emergencies, the European Commission can always uh, activate this public emergency uh, status um, that will require you to have immediate open access to both publications and data. Um, but again, this will be made more um, clear if it ever arises in the future. Um, I want to mention about the, the portal uh, in terms of reporting and monitoring, because I think that's something that is a bit confusing sometimes uh, when you actually need to, to do the reporting. Um, just, just so you know, the project officer will be reviewing on a periodic uh, period. The, uh, they will be monitoring basically your, uh, your project. Um, but you also need to add uh, specific details about it. Some are structured under, um, um, some are free text and others are, um, are fields that you need to, to um, fill in. So there are three different sections that interest us on the portal is publications. Uh, first of all, where you would add any publications that you uh, that you have they will automatically uh, so it's not very clear because the screenshots are not very high quality but you will see that the 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 portal will actually suggest uh, publications that probably are from you be careful because it does it's quite um broad in so a lot of those papers might not be yours uh, so be, just be careful what you're adding. Once you're adding, uh, they are here. It's just for reference. You can come back to this presentation and have a better look at it. But it explains what the different fields uh, mean. Another category that we are interested in is data sets. Again, if you deposit on a trusted repository because it has a DOI attached to it, um, it will automatically suggest it for you and you can just automatically add it. Um, and there's also results and other results that uh, I might be a bit confusing. I'm, I myself am still not fully sure what the difference is in some aspects, but results are more focused on the content of the results or so discoveries, any theories, any products, services, methods that you created based on uh, the, the project. And other results is more reporting about the tools, the software, the workflows, the protocols that you use to, um, to, uh, during, the, during the project. So this is an overview of um, the requirements. And now Julia is going to talk about the uh, publishing platform of the European Commission. You're muted, Julie. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. OK, uh, I hope uh, now it's not blinking anymore. OK, so uh, I will speak about uh, um, the one of the instruments of uh, uh, that the European Commission is giving for the beneficiaries of uh, Horizon Europe and not only uh, because it's uh, also available for other grants and is uh, Open Research Europe, which is a publishing platform. So basically a substitution of uh, a journal and not an archive. And this is us to be clear uh, for uh, all the beneficiaries. So Open uh, Research Europe is uh, a publishing platform uh, it can be considered as diamond open access because um, uh, the fee is covered entirely by the European Commission. It was launched in March uh, 2021, and uh, now it's uh, also indexed uh, in uh, um, Scopus. 
Uh, it's a high quality, reliable, efficient and transparent process in the way it's published. Uh, there, is an ex, uh, there is an advice report uh, made by several experts in a different scientific domain and different stage of uh, um, their career. Uh, since the cost is uh, totally um, paid by the Commission, there is uh, uh, no APC faced by authors, neither by reader. Uh, the nice things of this platform is that um, beside the fact that you have an immediate publication, meaning that in any case, when you submit a paper, it will be reviewed by editors, at least for uh, um, language check and uh, um, also uh, the consistency uh, through the paper. And then uh, it will be published in uh, um, in pre-publication before uh, you pass by uh, the open peer review. All of this process is open, uh, so uh, there is no fear uh, because everything uh, um, is uh, transparent, but also you have the assurance that uh, um, there are editors that are uh, working uh, in reviewing anything behind uh, the, the paper. You can publish uh, uh, most of uh, all the research output, but uh, uh, you can also use uh, uh, a link uh, with uh, other publication. We will speak about this later. Um, you can also uh, look at the different uh, metrics uh, that will be present in the article. Uh, all the contents, uh, as I said, are uh, indexed uh, not only Scopus, but also in uh, Google Scholar and uh, Explore for Open Air. Um, and uh, uh, everything is uh, archived in Zenodo once it's passed the peer review. So the uh, process is uh, uh, you submit the article. Um, and uh, uh, you have a preprint version within 10 days uh, that uh, is uh, enabled you already to view and cite uh, the work. Uh, there is an invitation process uh, in which you can suggest uh, the uh, peer reviewer that you want, or you can choose among a list that is provided by the platform. Then you can uh, uh, revise, the, uh, you, you will have uh, uh, the uh, peer review completed, at least two, and you can revise your article and uh, submit the second version. Uh, so uh, here you can see um, the, the various type of uh, um, acceptance. So if it's past the peer review, you will have uh, these two tick box. If it's passed with the reservation, you will have uh, this uh, um, question mark. So you draft the paper and uh, in the process of the submission before even the preprint, you will have this uh, uh, editor check. Uh, after the submission, there will be the peer reviewing uh, and the revisions. Uh, then it will be accept. Uh, for publication uh, when uh, um, the peer review is passed uh, and uh, you copy and type setting uh, uh, everything and you have the record in the final publication. Open Research Europe, uh, as I said before, is uh, offering the possibility of publishing not only the classical manuscript, but also different type of articles. This is the list that uh, it came by searching between different disciplines. So you can publish, in, you can publish uh, case studies, uh, research articles, brief report, data notes, uh, method articles, uh, open letter. Uh, software tour article uh, and also data notes, uh, meaning that you can publish your uh, data, uh, your data set uh, in uh, archives uh, like uh, Zenodo, and uh, you can uh, have the possibility to comment in uh, um, in an article all this uh, data. 
in a way that it's not uh, uh, poorly publishing the data or codes. Uh, you can also publish review, case report, a registered report, clinical practice, study protocol, systematic review, and also essay, which is important particularly for social science uh, and uh, uh, humanities, because uh, in, uh, in the first uh, uh, period of uh, the launching of the Open Research Europe, it was also um, considered that uh, different uh, disciplines have different preferential uh, um, publication. And the good things of Open Research Europe is that uh, you can publish anything. Uh, so the, the pre-publication checks, uh, it's, uh, um, it's uh, ba made by the editorial team. So you are not just publishing uh, um, an article without any check. There is a pub plagiarism check, an ethical approv approval, a language review, if it's uh, uh, adhering to the guidelines, uh, there is a check on uh, the data availability, uh, the, a check on the analysis and the method, and uh, the authorship criteria that are considered. Uh, the open peer review process, uh, as I said, you will have different uh, kind of approval. If it's totally approved, you will have this tick box. If it's approved with the reservation with a question mark or not approved with uh, this uh, uh, X mark. Uh, the open peer review uh, process for authors uh, has also uh, the uh, vision that uh, the peer review can be uh, cited. Uh, and that uh, it increased the collaboration uh, opportunities, it reduced the, the, uh, the bias, um, the author can empower the lead the process so you can have feedback that are openly and constructive and not just to destroy a manuscript or a paper. And uh, uh, the peer reviewers can also state in the open peer review what they are uh, stronger at and uh, what they don't feel to, um, to for instance, uh, um, measure or provide feedback. The open peer review uh, is an important process also in uh, the required, uh, um, in the required, because you, in the required, um, um, option that is given by the European Commission in terms of practicing open science. And uh, the good things of the Open Research Europe platform is that you can also candidate yourself to be a peer reviewer. And you can also cite uh, in the future what are your contribution in the open peer review process. Uh, this is an example, again, uh, of uh, the platform. Uh, what you will see if uh, the article is uh, uh, revised or not, if it's awaiting for peer review, or um, uh, which uh, a version is uh, in the process, if it's approved or approved with the reservation. Uh, there are uh, uh, open peer review uh, examples uh, as well here. Um, you can see um, in, uh, in the box that will be on the right side of the platform, you will see uh, at the review status, uh, what are the version uh, who um, with, uh, approved or not, if the same uh, peer review are being conducted and what was uh, the, um, the process of accepting or not. So this is uh, uh, on the left screen, you will see um, the template when you submit the process, uh, the, the, the article. So you can choose the article type, the title, the abstract, the keywords. You can also publish uh, the abstract in, uh, um, in a lay, uh, in, um, um, so in uh, another uh, in a language that is easy to comprehend from uh, uh, any type of uh, people uh, like the layman abstract uh, you can also um, 
uh, state what are what is the contribution based on the credit uh, taxonomy and uh, um, you can uh, um, add all the affiliation. On the right side, you can also make uh, a screen on the QR code to, um, to be informed by the newsletter of the Open Research Europe. Um, Open Air is a non-profit organization. Um, so we provide also tools to support uh, Horizon Europe uh, projects. Um, so uh, there is not just uh, Open Research Europe. Uh, Open Research Europe is a platform for publishing, but Open Air offers other tools that are uh, free at the point of uh, uh, user researchers in this case. So as I said before, you can maximize uh, your uh, um, grant uh, uh, impact uh, by publishing a, a very uh, different type of articles, um, as well as, for instance, data notes. There are several steps uh, to open data. So you can prepare the, your data sets to share. Uh, you can select a repository and you can add the, the statement of data availability in Open Research Europe, for instance, or any kind of other publishing platform that uh, you prefer, uh, preferably in open access. So I'm going uh, now for tips and tricks for data management. Uh, you can plan. Uh, you can plan your data by uh, the data management plan. The data management plan can be considered as uh, a map of the data sets that you are producing, and also uh, how much uh, uh, are uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, interoperable, and reusable. So how much uh, they are compliant with the fair principle. Um, the research. Uh, it's important because you can write what is the purpose of uh, your research and uh, the several uh, objectives and uh, who are uh, your collaborator. You can also document your research data sets uh, by um, highlighting the steps that you are following, um, attaching uh, the ethical approval, um, the uh, uh, um, the data management activities that you are uh, working on, uh, the language, the ethics, and the licensing. What OpenAir is offering is these tools called uh, Argos, but there are several DMP tools uh, present, and you can search in uh, the European uh, Open Science Cloud EOSC. Argos is uh, providing a template for Horizon Europe, um, Horizon 2020, if uh, someone of you has uh, still to report. And uh, uh, it's uh, offering uh, the type of template in which is uh, forcing uh, some, somehow to um, comply with the FAIR principle. And then you can publish the DMP. And it's an important uh, uh, tool for you uh, because uh, Argos is directly uh, connected with Zenodo. So in a simple button, you can uh, uh, publish uh, your uh, DMP and be uh, compliant with all uh, uh, the requirements for uh, Horizon Europe and Horizon 2020. Um, you can prepare your data for sharing. So in the case you have uh, data that uh, data that has to be anonymized, uh, we have another tool that is called Amnesia. Amnesia is helping uh, to avoid the pseudo anonymization and make it full anonymized in a way that uh, the data uh, that you are providing are not uh, uh, associated with uh, people. And this is uh, helping you in the sharing uh, uh, the data sets in a fair manner. There are uh, several do and not do in terms of uh, um, increasing the accessibility and the reusability of uh, spreadsheet data. Um, you can, uh, what you should do is uh, um, to uh, give a description heading, meaning uh, also a description of the data set that you are providing. Um, 
uh, make sure that the format is correct and that, that you are that you are following uh, several of these uh, uh, rules that uh, I'm showing you here. Um, you uh, need also to make sure that uh, uh, the support uh, format is uh, interoperable and uh, that you are not uh, including uh, special characters. So there are several uh, rules that uh, you can access also in uh, uh, the do's and not do's that are present also in Open Research Europe platform uh, or also in the guideline published in Open Air. Uh, as uh, it was mentioned before uh, by um, Jonathan, uh, you can select uh, a repository. Um, if uh, you don't know uh, where or how to deposit, uh, you can go to Open Air Explore and uh, uh, search uh, the data sources uh, or uh, uh, find a way uh, to deposit uh, by clicking in the right link. Or you can also use the link uh, session that is helping you in uh, linking uh, uh, what you are producing as data sets with the project, with the, um, with the publication. Uh, before uh, Jonathan mentioned uh, this, uh, um, what is uh, uh, um, trusted repository. So if you missed that, please. Uh, <laughs> Rewatch uh, our video. Um, in the article, uh, you should also um, be able to add the data availability statement. This statement uh, should be added uh, to the end of the article prior to the submission. So basically, uh, you can uh, uh, have a section in uh, the article manuscript. In uh, the good things again of uh, the Open Research Europe platform is that all these requirements are already checked at the editorial level before you are publishing the preprint. So let's see that. Let's say that this is like an extra um, help that uh, the platform is giving to you. Uh, make sure that uh, uh, the links of your uh, research uh, uh, output or product are linked together. Uh, the data management plan is uh, a live document and the good things of using a tool like Argos is that you can update uh, directly on the cloud uh, your data management plan because it's uh, a change from uh, the planning at the beginning after the six months and you can be able also to publish it at the end of the project in a way that you are showing also um, what uh, where your uh, different uh, um, understanding during the project or uh, different uh, tools that uh, you prefer to use or different instrument that uh, you had to use during the process and uh, during the project in general. Um, OpenAir uh, uh, with uh, Explore offer you the possibility to link different uh, uh, source entities. It means uh, that, for instance, uh, you can uh, um, you can uh, upload uh, your datasets in any kind of archives uh, and uh, um, link here uh, with uh, your publication or uh, your uh, um, grant uh, agreement, uh, your uh, grant uh, uh, acronym or uh, project. And now I will pass uh, the microphone back to Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Julia. So just to finish this um, presentation and before going to the Q&A, I want to mention some aspects about um, if you're writing the grant proposals, um, because you're probably at different stages. Some of you might uh, already have a, a Horizon Europe grant, but others might, of you might be uh, still writing one. Uh, so here are a few pointers about uh, the different parts within the application form and the project proposal that are linked to open science. Um, 
this will be in the in, in the presentation, so you can refer back to it. Uh, but here are the different parts where you need to really uh, pay attention in uh, mentioning those different aspects of open science. A few things are very important to bear in mind when uh, you are writing your grant proposal. Any publication, any of your publication that you cite during the grant proposal must be in open access. If one of your publication is uh, not on a repository or is under embargo and all that, you cannot, well, you shouldn't be uh, mentioning it because it's not in open access. All your publications that you cite need to be in open access and they will be judged on the qualitative aspect of the, the research, not on the impact factor of the journal in which they are. Um, I don't know if you know, but the European Commission does not uh, evaluate the impact of a paper of your work on the impact factor of the journal anymore. This is has become irrelevant. It's on the actual uh, impact that it has on research itself. Um, you can also give insights on where you want to be publishing. So if you're looking at two full open access journals or uh, publishing on Open Research Europe, I would definitely mention that. In terms of data, is a similar thing, but linked to the FAIR principles. Any data that you use, uh, any of your data that you cite in the grant proposals that you uh, would like to build upon for the during the grant proposal needs to follow the FAIR principles. So meaning that it needs to be on the, on, on the repository, it needs to be uh, well formatted, well documented, all those aspects that make uh, the, the FAIR principles. And obviously it needs to have an, a PID, so a personal identifier like a, a DOI. A DMP, an official DMP is not required uh, during the grant proposal, but they do ask you to answer a few questions that are to me very similar to a DMP. So even if officially it's not a DMP, it's kind of the same questions. So you still do need to do that same exercise of writing a DMP. It's just less in details. Uh, and there's a distinct work package on project management that must include a, the DMP as a deliverable. There are other aspects that need to be included in the budget, uh, and I would emphasize actually that uh, it is actually recommended to be adding this type of budget because it shows the European Commission that you've thought about the open science implication of your project. So asking for more money in this specific area is actually a, a good thing because you're showing that you've thought about how to make the most impact of your research in terms of those open science practices. Um, any data curation costs, if you need a, um, a data curator, for instance, if you need a specific storage space uh, because you have big data, all these costs can be included and should be included during the grant proposal. Engagement with citizens, uh, civil society, um, all this kind of citizen science and participation crowdsourcing activities can also in be included. And article processing charges can uh, be included for full open access journals, but again, not for hybrid journals. Um, I already mentioned that in the previous slides, but in terms of writing tips is there's no right or wrong answer as always. It's, you know, that's why some uh, uh, one proposal are successful, not others are not, but be as specific as possible, especially in terms of the open science. Uh, don't let the project officer uh, dig for information because they won't and uh, you'll, it won't be as impactful. One thing that I've seen a lot also in um, those proposals is um, people are going to start explaining what open access is, what fair data, what open science. The project officers, the people reviewing your grants know what all of those are. Don't waste time on that. Really focus on what those open access, fair data, open science principles are for your, your specific project. 
Um, a few special cases, uh, so the ERC and the Marie Curie um, uh, grant proposals. For the ERC grants, there's no explicit evaluation of the requirement to describe open science practices, but it's a bonus, it's a positive bonus if uh, you include it. Uh, they don't have a specific work package or deliverable, um, but they do now require um, um, a research data management uh, work package with a DMP as one of the deliverables. In terms of the MSCAs, um, there's a lot more emphasis on open science. Um, it is really explicitly mentioned um, of this underlying principles of open science responsibility research and innovation. Um, there is also um, an explicit mention about um, the excellence criteria that will be weighted with the quality of open science practices. And the, within the grant proposal, they must address uh, training activities, carry development plan um, to uh, improve or to teach basically to the people that are, um, to the, uh, the grant holder, the, um, the open science uh, principles. So there's a real emphasis on that on uh, the Marie Curie fellowships. Now a few more uh, details, um, because I mentioned about publications and data, but there are also other open science recommended practices. They are not mandatory, but they will always be um, have a positive impact on it. So they will never have a negative impact if they're not addressed, but they will have a positive impact. Um, there's a non-exhaustive list that you can find on, on their website or on uh, other resources. Um, so these might include pre-registration, pre where you're basically going to um, publish the plan of study, the, the methods, the, uh, the research question, the hypothesis, research design uh, on, um, on a platform before actually doing the research. Um, doing this will be viewed as a, as a positive way of sharing your being as transparent as possible. So it will be um, scored positively. Preprints, uh, there's a possibility of before sending your paper to a, a journal or a publisher, you can put it on a preprint uh, server. Uh, the most famous one is Archive, uh, but nowadays there's many more in a lot of different uh, fields. And because you are basically, uh, th those preprints uh, servers do have a um, persistent identifier, a DOI, so meaning that people can already start uh, citing your work even before peer review, before being published officially. Especially if you're in a competitive field, it can also give you um, first exclusivity on a specific uh, research because you actually made it available online before um, others, even though it's it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. Once it gets peer reviewed, then it, the, the, the preprint server will link to, to the published version. Public engagement is seen uh, more and more as a really positive thing. So any type of public engagement that you do with um, schools within museums in any type of you know um social impact on on the on the on the public uh, will have um if you include that in the grant proposal will be positively uh, uh rewarded and citizen science if your project calls for that um that's obviously something that is becoming more and more uh well regarded and important for the European Commission. There's a more uh, emphasis on, on you know, using as many resources as possible, including the members of the public that are interested in taking part of research projects. Um, here you can find some examples to it, more uh, resources about it, uh, but it's something to, to bear in mind uh, when you're um, writing your proposal. 
So just to finish, uh, an overall few tips about that is when you're thinking about your um, proposal, your research project, already start designing an open science strategy for your project because this will help in the long term of how to um, not add open science practices to your to your research, but make it um, to encompass it uh, completely. Um, so you need to include uh, where your publication and where your data will be deposited, who is responsible for this. So be really clear about who's responsible for what in, in the project. Um, who will make sure that this is being done because, you know, when you're working with uh, different uh, institutions, then it can, you know, communication is key for that. Um, and obviously keep track of any issues and discuss the solution among the, the consortium. So this is the end for uh, this talk. Now we'll go to the, the Q&A. Uh, I just want to mention a few uh, events that are coming up. So um, the next webinar, which is basically the same thing as this one, um, uh, will be on the 3rd of July at uh, 12 CET. Um, the... OpenAI is also uh, co-organizing um, a conference about open science called the Open Science Fair that will be in September. Uh, the call for proposals um, are already out. If you are interested in going further than your field or if you are in the field of open science, you are more than welcome to uh, either send proposals or just attend the, the conference. And if you're an open science trainer, we organize uh, twice a year uh, what we call the uh, Open Science Train the Trainer Bootcamp, uh, which is basically a week of quite intensive um, presentation, interactions, um, assignments that we all do together to improve uh, your skills and your abilities to communicate about open science practices to everyone else. Um, so it will be on the week of the 22nd of May and application deadlines are until the end of the month. Uh, on this, if you have any questions, oh, well, I know that you have questions because I was already answering some of them on the Q&A. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions you can write them in the q a and vote and uh, for the ones you would like to um, be answered so let's have a look i answered uh, to a few but uh, i have also made some questions for a few of them because for me it was not uh, clear the question so you can go also in uh, answer it or directly in the mm -hmm. So if you if you look at the questions, you can also upvote them for the ones you would like to. So I'll go from most upvoted to um, first. So first question, is it mandatory to publish the metadata even if the associated data are not yet open? Yes, so you have to... Um, Basically, the, the, the reasoning behind this is that you want your research to be findable online immediately upon the creation so that people know that you're researching on this subject, that there will be data or there is data available. Um, you don't have to necessarily uh, publish the data immediately or you can close it, but the metadata itself has to be present on, online, yes. Um, are you planning to create a DMP catalog with good examples? Libre created one, but it does not seem maintained any longer. It would be something really useful, I agree. The difficulty I find is that it will differ greatly between um, fields, um, which would require a a lot of people to come together to decide on what um, good DMPs are. Also bear in mind that 
as I said, there's no right or wrong answer. So it's very uh, depending. So right now there's no um, plans of doing that. Um, even though we, it would be a, a good um, uh, a good thing to to do, obviously. Uh, how will the quality of the cited publication be determined by the evaluators during the proposal evaluation on the actual um, quality of the publication? So that's why the uh, during the grant proposals you have you are allowed to cite the maximum of five publication and all data sets. Uh, so they will evaluate um, based on actually reading your 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 paper, not on the journal impact factor, but on the actual content of your of your work. Um, if the impact factor of the journal is not going to be taken into account anymore, what other bibliometric indicators are going to be evaluated? As far as I know, the European Commission does not, and please Julia correct me, but I don't think they are using any bibliometric indicators. They are really taking the publication that you cite, so those five publications or data sets, and then reading them, and that's how they're basing their uh, their scores basically, but they're not using any bibliometric indicators. Um, yeah, um, okay. Uh, so at the moment, the, the question is a little bit more broad in the sense that uh, uh, what we are uh, uh, trying to work on or to support also the European Commission, uh, the Open Science Expert, but not only, is to change uh, the research assessment in general. Uh, meaning that uh, we are not focusing on uh, just uh, the bibliometric impact. What uh, uh, at the moment uh, is considered more valuable, it's uh, uh, the citation and the, the loads of the article and the reuse of uh, the data or uh, publication. But uh, again, there is not uh, at the moment a clear, um, a clear view. What uh, is uh, evaluated at the end of the project for the um, Horizon projects is uh, the different uh, impact, the three impacts that you have to provide, which are uh, the societal, the economical, and uh, the scientific impact. Uh, if you want help, uh, what we are providing in uh, OpenAir uh, Explore, it's also uh, to connect, to link, uh, the impact with the sustainable development goals of uh, the United uh, Nations. And this is my guide you somehow uh, to understand uh, what is uh, the impact of uh, your publication. But again, uh, at the moment, there is uh, not uh, uh, specific rules. So what is more valuable is the narrative curriculum or what you are explaining uh, uh, for you to be valuable for the others. Thanks, Julia. And question for you again also, what is the uptake of Open Research Europe? Is it used a lot? I haven't checked lately, so. <laughs> I have not the recent statistic, but uh, yes, the in it is very, uh, it is increasing the usage uh, also because uh, the fact that it doesn't uh, have a specific aim like uh, other journals, it allows uh, people that have a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary projects to publish uh, easier uh, without any barrier. Um, apparently, uh, the biggest use are in the medical uh, uh, field and also social science because uh, you have uh, no limits in the land uh, or limits in the type of publication. But I can't give you the number at the moment. In the grant proposal, we cannot cite old articles which are not open access and many are still not and not all countries care about open access to the same extent. Um, some key documents for us were not published as open access. 
Theoretically, yes. That means that you're, you cannot cite those type of articles. I would argue, though, that most articles nowadays are um, able to be made available in open access. And the, the, the wording I'm using is important. I'm not talking about publishing open access. So I'm not talking about paying the journal for open access but make it available which would we we would refer to as green open access maybe some of you know that um issue check on sharpa romeo if venkat or julia you could um write the uh, the website to sharpa romeo you can check basically for each publisher what you are allowed or not most of them, after an embargo to maximum 24 months, that's the maximum I think I've seen, or 36 months, uh, you are allowed to put the author accepted manuscript on a repository. It does mean that you don't have the rights probably on the author accepted manuscript. So you don't retain, you didn't retain your rights. So it's not under a Creative Commons license, but this is not important uh, for, this is only for the requirements during the project. But as long as it's made accessible in open access, meaning it's on, on a repository uh, freely available, then it is considered open access. So those uh, most articles can be actually made available in open access. It's really rare when uh, the journals block you completely from, um, from uploading this author accepted manuscript on the repository. So please do check on Sharpa Romeo to see what the politics are of each uh, publisher. And if your publication is not in open access, then deposit it uh, that version on the uh, on on the repository to make it available um i am supporting numerous eu projects for data management and dmps and also doing dmp training but i rarely see real reviewing of dmp by eu experts are the dmp really reviewed where the criteria others from science europe is there a delay for reviewing? Are you aware of any budget impact if a bad DMP is submitted? I actually have no idea if I, they... can, I can answer this. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, at the moment there is uh, no evaluation uh, in the sense that uh, what uh, the biggest evaluation of the DMP is based on the fair uh, information that you are providing. Uh, so if it's a fair compliant and this is uh, like uh, there are several tools that you can find in uh, in a way to make it um, as much as findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Again, my suggestion is uh, to use a machine actionable uh, data management plan like Argos because it's guiding you through this and join our open air uh, Argos community call every Wednesday at the end of the month, in which we can address a little bit in deeper uh, this kind of um, questions. But uh, uh, there is not an, any official uh, evaluation for the moment. Probably the evaluation will be on the fair uh, um, information that you are providing. I would say also that you know, I understand the the why the question was asked. I would also be careful of starting to say, well, it's not really being reviewed, and then start not caring too much, because at one point it will, you know, they will increase in in the way that they are reviewing. So you don't think that because they're not necessarily looking in details right now that they want in in the future, and also uh, as a lot of you might know that the engagement of the project officer of the of the EC varies greatly. Some of them are really on your back all the time, and others are very relaxed. Say, let's say so. <clears throat> it really depends on on your project officer of each specific uh, project. Also, unfortunately, um, we have a question regarding the disclaimer to be included in all publications. Uh, funded by the European Union, views and opinions expressed are, however, those of the authors. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so this is about the space limit. I think I saw something like that also about the space limit of the uh, rights retention strategy. Uh, it's difficult to include it due to its length. Um, I actually don't know how to, I, I would, uh, I don't know if Julia, you have a, a, an answer to that. I would actually um, contact the journal directly and tell them um, about this. In, I had a feeling that a lot of journals did not consider the acknowledgement as part of the word count, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but I would directly contact them and say, we need to include this sentence. It's required by, you know, our funder. Can you just exclude that from the word count? I, I would actually communicate directly with the journal because this is something we, it's on a case by case basis, unfortunately. So I, I can't really give any um, advice on, on that apart from asking the, the journal directly. Yes. And um... Um... Eventually, you can double check with the project officer and then uh, what is the statement and uh, what is allowed. And then uh, you can contact uh, the publisher and it uh, should be good. Similar to the H2020 manual, is a DMP template for Horizon Europe? And then I see a lot of, um, so yes, there is, so there is a template. Uh, it is on the first, the second slide of this presentation, there's a link to all the different uh, official documents. Um, there's a template. Uh, if you use the Argus um, DMP creator, it's also as a template there. I know that other DMP tools like DMP online also has it. So usually it's, it's fine. I just want to mention that even though there is a template, what the European Commission and any other funder really wants, it's for you to address the different uh, fair principles and making sure that your DMP is as uh, detailed as possible. So the template itself is not as important as the content of it. Don't get stuck on the, on the, the template if you have a a good vision of what you want to and which order you want to present. Usually, except if I'm so far, I'm, I haven't heard any um, negative feedback about straying away from the, the, the templates. Um, but it's really more about the content rather than following the, the, the template. Because if you follow the template, but it's, there's just one sentence for each one, for each concept, then that won't pass. But if you don't follow the template, but all the information required in the MP is there, it, there shouldn't be any problems because that's at the end what's the um, is important. Um, do you have a view on the reviewing process of the MPs by the project officers or externals? How many initial DMPs after six months are accepted, rejected? What are the reasons for rejection? The reason can be, yeah, yeah. Um, the reason uh, can be uh, if uh, there are not provided some information, for instance, on the ethics or uh, any kind of approval, or you need extra information. Uh, for instance, if you are using uh, Animals, uh, you may need uh, the um, more information. So these are the kind of uh, um, of possibility in which you can get the rejection. But uh, at the moment, uh, um, as I said before, there are no strong uh, uh, no strong uh, evaluation. I would say it also depends on again the project officer how. In detail, I know when I, I used to work for an institution for a university, there were some project officers that just were really harsh on um, on on that evaluation, and others just I read the DMP. I was like, there's a lot of information missing, but it it went through. So it really depends on on that. If you have any doubts, I would say uh, contact your local um, library or research support staff to get training on what exactly needs to be included in a DMP, because obviously we can't go through all those elements. 
um, but there are some training on online also. There are some webinars um, that you can um, look at to have a better understanding of what the other things that you might be missing in it. Uh, in many, yeah, sorry. Sorry, uh, no, no, I was thinking you finished. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I finished, I finished. I was reading the next, uh, please. <laughs> uh, okay, because there is a pending question uh, that in which I asked uh, more information and here I have. So it's uh, for uh, the longer formats uh, and uh, here for longer formats, they mean uh, monographs or book chapters. Are the CC by and C and D licensing uh, allowed or mm -hmm. just non-commercial or uh, uh, non-derivative, but both? They're not allowed. Um, only the CC by non-commercial or the CC by non-derivatives. You have to understand that the CC by non-commercial non-derivatives derivatives, is very similar to a full copyright. It, it doesn't really have any shareable impact. It's basically saying you can't do anything with my work. So it's not really useful. Um, that's why the European Commission goes for, it's nice enough, I would say, to go for that you're allowed to use one or, or the other. There is also this question that uh, I'm I'm not fully getting. Maybe you can answer, Jonathan. Um, are other uh, historical publication costs, uh, as example, uh, color chargers uh, fees for overland, uh, excluded from uh, reimbursement within the European projects? Uh... Uh, it, it depends. I can't remember. Um, it depends if in terms of open them. access, you're not allowed. This is not reimbursable within the concept of open access. APCs is just for the open access. Color charges. I want to say that you're not allowed, but I might be mistaken with another funder. I would need to to check that um, because different funders have completely different uh, opinion about that. But I think you you cannot um include those those fees i think yeah. in any case uh, you should check also the budget plan and see uh, if uh, if you can add this information but again um, if uh, you are facing uh, so many difficulties i would also suggest to go for uh, Open Research Europe in which uh, these kind of things are, are uh, overcame. Like you can do, you can publish any kind of lens you want. Okay. Um, so next one. In many cases, the data has commercial value. How do you define this? Uh, commercial value means that basically the data will be used for any type of um, financial gain by either the institution or the authors uh, by them creating um, an SME or something like that, that will allow them to sell a product, sell a service based on the data or the research that was done. Um, classic example will be if you build, I don't know, um, solar cells uh, for solar panels uh, in innovative uh, way, you're going to close the data for a certain time while well, you can resell that product to entities or build your own company to resell that. Um, and that would be considered as commercial. If at one point this uh, uh, is no longer, and, and obviously you can open the data after an embargo period that you consider is long enough to have made a commercial impact. Um, the, the, the issue with commercial, uh, the definition of commercial 
aspects in terms of the legal aspect. It's it's very broad. Um, if I was uh, being paid to give this presentation, for instance, if I was being paid by um, an external company as an invited uh, speaker, that would be considered as commercial. So it's a very broad. So a lot of things can be considered as a commercial value. In this specific context of your project, I would uh, ask the project officer basically for advice on, on that. Or if you if you work in an institution or in a university, there are some um, people within your institution that are um, uh, how did they, uh, technology transfer officers, um, the copyright officers, there's uh, the in intellectual property rights officers. Those people are the, the, the people that you need to contact to get more information about, um, about this. Um, eligible in the budget, data creation cost in means that I can't include the data steward for all the project, only means of all little tasks, do it by third. No, no, you can definitely, if you need a data steward in your project, you can definitely include those as, um, as you would for, uh, I need a um, um, lab technician for, for my work, data steward would also be considered as, um, as eligible, definitely. Um, okay, this, I'm, I'm going to read it. I'm not going to answer it. Uh, ultimately, the success or failure of Open Research Europe will depend on whether they are considered high impact. Will young researchers CV showing Open Research Europe submissions be valued or triaged during the selection process? Will the EU, can the EU influence this? It's a very, it's a more philosophical question. It will, it's because if those um, young researchers are applying for EU projects, then definitely it will have a high impact because we're not evaluating uh, they're not evaluating on the the uh, the any impact factor. If you go to other countries where they're still uh, highly influenced by the impact factor, yes, that will definitely have an, an impact on it, unfortunately. But this is more global issue of um, reforming the research assessment. So it's difficult to, it really depends on your fields and where those people want to be heading. If they want to stay in the EU, I would say um, that's not an issue because most funders are now going for a non, uh, a more qualitative um, assessment of um, researchers. Um, I am not sure I quite understand what you mean by don't let the project professor dig for information. Could you expand on that? Um, I would say that you have, you know what you're doing. You as a researcher, you know that uh, you're going to save your files as Excel files and then share them with others. You know that you have this common knowledge that if someone enters the project, they might not have. And so basically imagine that you're, it's just a text that you're giving to the project officers they're not going to come back to you as like, oh, and, and this I don't understand. Did you do this? Or they're not going to ask you questions. You should have all the information for them. You, you really want to give them all the information beforehand so they, they don't need to question, basically. If I'm reading the, I'm the project officer, I'm reading the uh, a DMP, and I'm like, I, I don't know this step, what they're doing. It just suddenly appears there's data then that means that you missed a step in explaining what uh, the, the information is. So it's basically be as specific and detailed as possible. Try and think about all the things that you know and apply and put them by writing, basically. It's you just want to prove to the, to the uh, project officers that you know what you're doing, basically. Thank you. I think uh, we are uh, about uh, to One conclude uh, our uh, webinar and we will answer to uh, all the questions that are uh, in the Q&A uh, in the next uh, blog post.
So please uh, keep posted uh, with the open air uh, social and uh, uh, you can also uh, write us in the appdesk.openair.eu uh, if you have anything uh, specific or ask uh, our uh, note uh, to answer. So we have uh, a person uh, more or less everywhere in Europe. So let us know. All the best. Bye. Thank you so much to everyone and uh, have a great uh, rest of the day. Thank you and goodbye all. <laughs>